Chapter 14 Once they hit the outskirts of Arcadia, the extent of the devastation became painfully clear. Whole sections of town were literally gone. There was nothing left. As many of the homes for migrant workers were nothing more than mobile homes, they had no strength to stand up to any sort of heavy winds. So large numbers of the homes had been reduced to twisted piles of metal, insulation and their furnishings. Daniel wanted to say something, to offer some words of hope and encouragement, but he didn't know what to say. Besides, he knew that anything he did say, Kelly would see right through it. So they drove on in silence, and he focused on watching for pedestrians. He tried to turn on the radio for some entertainment or news, all he got was static. Realising that the stations were off the air and a reminder of the devastation around them, he switched it off. No cars or trucks were on the roads, other than military vehicles, but there were many people walking around, most were carrying empty plastic jugs, clearly they were looking for clean water. At first Daniel was confused by that, didn't people have water in their homes? Then he remembered, Arcadia didn't have central water, everyone had wells, so without power there was no water running. Finally, they turned onto Hardgrave and Daniel's heart sank. More crash buildings lined the way, Ralph and Penny's house was brick. How had it fared? There it is, Kelly cried out. Daniel looked. He couldn't quite see the house. The oak trees in the front yard were down and they blocked a clear view of the building. The roof sort of looked intact, but the peak had collapsed. Had it caved in on the rooms below? Pulling off to the side of the road he parked and they jumped out of the car. What a mess. Kelly didn't wait a moment. She began beating her way through the branches toward the front door. Kelly, careful, you don't want one of those branches to swing back and whack you in the face, Daniel called out to her. That's the least of my worries, she replied. As if in response to her words, a branch promptly swung around and smacked her in the behind. Daniel grabbed a machete from the back seat and joined her, hacking and slashing their way through. Before they reached the front door, it creaked and groaned and finally opened. Nick stepped out on the stoop. The man looked as if he'd gone ten rounds with Mike Tyson. Howdy there, strangers, he chirped. If you're here for breakfast, I'm afraid we're closed for business. You might want to try the IHOP down the street. Kelly threw herself into his arms, and they just stayed there for a few minutes. Mum and Dad, she said, her voice croaking with worry. He smiled, even as he took Daniel's hand. They're okay. They're all okay. Even that stinking little rat dog of Mum's is okay. Kelly just about collapsed and burst into tears. A moment later... Penny came out the door, also looking less than fantastic. There followed more hugs, kisses and tears. Oh mum, I was so worried. Where's dad? Checking over what's left of his tools, Penny said. Nick nodded. Yeah, he's been out in the one car garage all morning. Kelly's brow wrinkled. Nick, they've got two car garage. Ah, uh, not anymore, sis. What? Kelly said, her voice going up about two octaves. Penny nodded. It's true, dear. And the porch area, it's back to being a bare concrete slab. I was lucky to rescue my Rudy Vallely collection. Nick rolled his eyes. Yes, thank goodness the power's out. Ralph, coming out the door, playfully smacked Nick in the back of the head. Son, don't tease your mother. And get out the way. I want my turn at my daughter. Daddy, Kelly cried and hugged him. After that, they went inside and Daniel and Kelly got a full rundown on the events from the storm. The house was a wreck. Huge areas of the ceiling had caved in and the rooms were all drenched, smelly and piled high with broken furniture. Daniel let out a long, slow whistle. Oh man, he hardly knew where to begin. Oh mum, dad, you can't stay here, Kelly said, pulling out the radio. Here, let me check with the guard and see if they've got an evacuation centre set up yet. Daniel slowly nodded. She was right. He sniffed the air. Something good was cooking and he noticed Ralph was wearing his barbecue apron. Was he grilling something? Ah, Ralph, what's cooking? Daniel said. Ralph gestured for them to follow him, and he led them out to the backyard. Once there, Daniel could see what Penny meant. The entire porch was gone, blasted right down to the bare concrete pad. Off to one side, a rather beaten and battered grill was cooking away. A table, also in less than stellar shape, was next to the grill, propped up on some cinder blocks. On it were plates piled high with burgers, steaks, pork chops and other meats. Ralph stepped over to the grill and poked at some sausages, sizzling on the grill. Ah, looks like these are about ready. Who's ready for seconds? He called out. Daniel looked around. The yard was full of people. It looked like the whole neighbourhood was there. And Junior was bounding around the place begging food from anyone and everyone there. Ah, Dad, what's going on here? And where'd you get that grill? That's not yours, Kelly said. Without power, our freezer is dead and all the meat is thawing out, Ralph said. Nick nodded. Yeah, so we figured we'd just have a big old barbecue and eat all we can. 
And besides, dear, cooked meat lasts longer than raw, Penny said. Ah, I see, Daniel said slowly. You cook it and any leftovers will stay edible for a while. Good plan, Ralph. As for the grill, it sort of came to us, Nick said. Since Dad took off for parts unknown, propane tank and all, we figured this was a good exchange. Oh, I see, Kelly replied. Uh, what about the briquettes, or, or do I want to ask? Nick laughed. Well, the neighbours and I sort of collected them from all around the neighbourhood. Took a bit of doing, but we found enough to cook things up. OK, well, you can cook all you want, but afterward we need to get you to a shelter, Kelly said. Let me get back on the radio, and I'll find out what's been set up. Do you really think that's necessary? Ralph asked. Can't we stay here? Kelly whipped out her radio, cupped it to her ear, and started to walk away from the group, probably so she could hear better. Daniel stepped between her and Ralph and shook his head. No, Mr Delany. I'd say that's impossible. Look around you. No power, no water, and this house about to cave in on itself, Daniel said. Ralph, throwing yet another bunch of burgers and hot dogs on the grill, sighed and slowly nodded. Yes, I guess you're right, Daniel. I just hate the idea of giving up on the place. It's been our home since we moved to Florida. Oh, Dad, don't let it get you down, Nick said. Hey, we get the insurance money. I'm sure you can rebuild it. For now, let's deal with getting Mum and the others to safety, OK? Ralph agreed, and a moment later, Kelly joined them it turned out that the shelter was being set up at the DeSoto High School. It was one of the few buildings left standing. So, Mum, Dad, you need to get as many of your important things pulled together. Insurance documents, some clothes, maybe a couple of blankets and pillows, and also your personal papers. Penny gathered Junior into her arms and sat in one of the few folding chairs. And food for Junior, right? She said. Kelly tugged at her hair. Mmm, I guess. Uh, I didn't even think about him. Gee, I wonder if they'll allow pets at the shelter. Ah, they may not, Daniel said. They didn't at our shelter, which is why Tony didn't come with us. Daniel blinked very fast as if he felt his throat tighten. He didn't want to break down in front of everyone. They'd tell Kelly's family about Tony later. What, no pets? Penny squeaked. Well, then I'm not going. Kelly again whipped out her radio even as she patted her mother's arm. Now, now, Mum, don't go thermal yet. Let me check with the guard personnel. It took a few minutes, Daniel was sure that the answer would be no, but he was surprised to see a big smile on her face. They said yes, Daniel said. Kelly nodded. Yeah, I guess they've had a change in policy. Daniel ground his teeth and truly felt as if the top of his head was about to burst into an erupting volcano any second. Mighty nice of them, he snapped. Maybe if they'd done that yesterday, Tony would still be alive. All around Daniel were surprised faces. He took a deep breath and tried to get his blood pressure down below boiling point. It was obvious that he'd surprised them, even Kelly. She stepped over and gave him a warm hug. Yes, Daniel, you're right. I guess I'm... I don't know what to say. There followed a quick explanation for the family, and they all expressed their deep regrets. After that, they all ate as much food as possible and passed it out to as many people as they could. When a squad of National Guard troops came by looking to help, Ralph pressed some of the food on them. So everyone truly ate well, and Kelly didn't even mind when her dad said prayers and started spouting his end-of-times speech. She did mention that she was surprised at Daniel. She had never heard him raise his voice in anger before, yet she told him that she understood in the case of poor Tony. The case was certainly just. Finally, when everything was cooked and most of it was eaten, the family worked to pull together as many of their personal items as they could find. Ralph and Penny got their wallet and purse, They got their little strong box of important papers, and then they threw some supplies into a cooler, including some dog food. Heading out to the garage to grab a few last-minute things, Daniel and Kelly both gasped to see the damage there. Truly, one entire side of the room was gone, and the neighbour's tree had flattened the car, like the proverbial pancake. Ah, so I guess we're taking my car, Daniel said. That could present a problem. Should I take you guys over in relays? As if in answer to his question, the roar of a large truck could be heard. Moving to see beyond the downed tree, they saw that the squad of guard troops had returned, with a deuce and a half-truck. Ralph smiled as the troops, men and women, hopped down and started to help everyone to load into the truck. Ah, you see, you show people a little Christian love and charity and it's returned to you. Yeah, Dad, you're right, Kelly said. With that, the family and their neighbours got loaded up, and then Kelly and Daniel followed the truck over to the high school. The place was quite the hotbed of activity, and it was clear that the guard had things well in hand. Daniel helped the family get settled, and Kelly radioed to Heidi a report on the situation. When she stepped over to him, she did not look happy. Daniel, we need to head back now. He chewed his lip. What's wrong? 
It's the new storm finale. She is one bad girl. She's building up faster, and she's more powerful than any storm we've ever seen. Heidi wants my input ASAP. He nodded, and then they made their goodbyes to her family. Here was the one instance where they had a major disagreement. Ralph was convinced that this was it. They were well and truly facing the end of times, and he wanted the family together to face it. Kelly refused, and she and Daniel jumped in his car and took off for Port Charlotte as fast as possible. The drive back to the hurricane center seemed long, even though Daniel knew it was actually quite fast. He really floored it going down King's Highway. Once back there, they dashed inside and met up with Heidi in the conference room. The place was still a mess, but at least some basic systems had been restored. The generators were keeping the computers and lights on. Fans were blowing, and a field kitchen was providing food. Heidi pulled up the latest data and finale and displayed it on the screen. Have a look, Kelly. She's up to a three and bearing down on the Caribbean. The unusually warm waters of the Atlantic are feeding this baby, and we think she'll be a Category 5 by the time she makes landfall. Kelly slowly shook her head. My goodness, I've never seen a storm build so fast. Heidi, we've got to warn the higher-ups. This storm could well and truly go off the scales. Kelly, they will never believe us, but I won't stop you if you want to file a report with them. All I ask is that you just file it. Do not go off on a rant about it when they ignore you. We've got a real crisis here to deal with now. Kelly sighed. Okay, Heidi, I understand. I'll do it and then get to work helping out here. Daniel, is there anything I can do to help you? No, it's okay, Kelly. I'm going to try and contact Gabby and then see about Greg and Anne. Heidi gestured toward a bank of phones on the conference room table. Those will work. Is she someplace where she might have a working phone? Yes, she was up in Sarasota working on a show when the storm hit, so she stayed there. If she's near a working phone, I might be able to get through to her. Thanks. Daniel said his goodbyes to Heidi and Kelly, giving the latter a warm kiss, and then they left to get to work on recovery efforts. He picked up a phone and dialed Gabby's number, and was pleased to hear her voice on the other end. There followed another rundown on what each had been through, and giving her the bad news about Tony. He also told her of his efforts to speak to Pop, and the outcome. She said she would check on him and try again to soften him up. As he hung up, Daniel had to wonder which was going to be worse, dealing with his dad or the gathering storm. Four days, Kelly was still in the office. Her apartment, as well as Heidi's and a bunch of their other co-workers, was torn to shreds, so living at the office seemed the only real viable alternative. None of the local hotels were in any condition to house them or anyone else. From there, they watched as Finale built up to become a Category 5 storm and, quite literally, flattened several Caribbean islands. The main office of the National Weather Centre did, as Kelly expected, reject her theory that the storm was going to go off the charts. Here she did exercise a bit of discretion and did not blow up at them. The one bit of good news came from Daniel. Greg, Anne and Jessica and little Jane, the new baby, were all okay. His other news was not so good. His dad was drinking again, quite heavily, and still refused to have anything to do with Daniel. Also, John's little beach bungalow was pretty much a total loss. It had been virtually washed into the intracoastal waterway, the channel between the shoreline and the main line and the coastal islands. Kelly continued to study the reports coming in from all over. If she wasn't dealing with the aftermath of Edward, she was trying to get a handle on Finale and where it was headed. She still hadn't found out who had leaked the storm's track to the media or who had changed all of Edward's tracks to agree with hers, but now was not the time to search for that answer. Kelly, look at this, Heidi said, tapping her on the arm. Kelly looked up and saw a report coming in from the Weather Channel. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. It had happened. The thing she'd said and always feared. The storm had gone beyond being a Category 5. The reporter stated that Finale now had sustained winds around 195 miles per hour and its gusts were topping out at over 245. Kelly slowly got to her feet. Oh, my. Her voice trailed off to silence and one by one everyone in the office turned to watch the report. The storm was still on course to strike the Daytona Beach area and then cut straight across Florida like a buzzsaw. After that came an announcement that the president had declared a state of emergency and the governor was going to speak to the state within the hour. Kelly, now it's my turn to ask you the question. What do we do? Heidi said slowly. I wish I knew, but I know of nothing that can help us. We have to evacuate the entire I-4 corridor. It's the only way. Heidi sighed. Kelly, look around. Most of the state's guard troops are scattered across three counties, trying to help with the aftermath of Edward. Evacuating the Orlando to Tampa area... That take weeks to do. We have maybe two or three days before Finale wipes that region clean. Kelly stepped over to the coffee maker and poured herself a cup of cold, stale coffee. She drank it, little noticing how cold and bitter it was. Something clicked in her mind. 
Cold. The cold. Sub-Zero. She spun to face Heidi. Wait, I have an idea. The Sub-Zero program. The what? Heidi asked, her brow wrinkling. Kelly began to race about, shifting through reports and printouts on her desk, and explained to Heidi about Daniel's system. When Kelly was done, Heidi slowly nodded and smiled. Interesting, she said. Do you think it could help? Kelly tugged on her hair. Well, to be honest, I don't know, but if there's a chance, we've got to take it. I agree, Heidi said. All right, you get in touch with Daniel. I'll call the National Science Board and the National Weather Service and run this by them. How soon can it be made ready? I don't know. It all depends on the subs and where they are. Heidi sighed, a sigh of resignation. Okay, well, that's another item we'll have to figure out. For now, let's get to it. With that, Heidi got on the phone and started talking like she'd never talked before. Meanwhile, Kelly went to pick up her phone when her other phone, her cell phone, rang. Fumbling a bit, she got it out of her back pocket and answered it. It was her dad. Hey dad, how's it going? She said. You guys settling in okay? We're fine, sweetie. But we've been watching the news reports about that storm, her dad said. Yes, I know, it's very bad and it looks like it could be disastrous for the state, if not the country, Kelly replied. Oh, it's much more than that, Kelly. This is it. This is the end. Kelly rolled her eyes. Oh, Dad, please, don't go on about your end of day stuff. I'm not in the mood for that now. Kelly, don't dismiss it like that, he snapped. Don't you see the signs? They're calling this storm a Category 6. It's a sixth storm of the season. Its name has six letters, and it formed into a hurricane on June 6th. Everywhere you look, there's a six. The number is 666. Revelation chapter 13, verses 17 and 18. That's the end of time. Bible prophecy and finale. Its name is Latin for the end. Also, we're in the year 2012, and according to the Mayan prophecy, this year is the end of times. Now, what other proof do you need to see that we're approaching Armageddon? We want you to come home and be with the family for the end time. Kelly tugged so hard on her hair she almost tore some of it out by the roots. Could you be right? She shook her head. Well, but I can't agree in front of him. That would make him even more nervous, she thought. Dad, I respect your beliefs, but I have a job to do. Now give my love to everyone there, and I'll talk to you. Hanging up, Kelly then dialed Daniel and explained the situation to him. Ah, Kelly, I don't know that this is going to work, he said. Why not? Well, my system was designed with the idea of dispersing a tropical depression, or maybe a tropical storm, but this, this is way beyond anything I ever dreamed of. So what, you don't think it has a chance of working? Kelly said, well, to be honest, I have no idea, Daniel replied. I mean, we can try it, just can't make any promises about how, if it'll work. Daniel, relax, we understand the limitations of the system, but it's the only thing we got, so can you come to a meeting about implementing it ASAP? Sure, where? Heidi is just working out the details, but I'm willing to bet it will be in Miami, Kelly said. Given the time frame, I'd say no later than tomorrow afternoon. Wow, that is short notice, but never fear, I'll be there. Kelly was right. Mr. Duran and Mr. Fenton jointly chaired an emergency meeting to discuss options for the coming crisis. She and Daniel were flown on a military jet down to Miami to make a presentation regarding the Sub-Zero program. When they were done, there was deep division as to what to do next. Ridiculous. General Lowe said. You expect us to call in Navy subs that were out on patrol and then send them out into the very heart of the worst storm in history? What other options are available to us, General? Kelly said. Do as the President and the Governor have said. Get the people out of harm's way. You really want to try a completely unproven system on the worst storm in history? That's beyond insanity. Daniel, you can't honestly think your system has a chance of working. Daniel slowly rose to his feet. He cleared his throat and cast his eyes around the table. I'm not going to lie to all of you, this isn't what my system was designed for, but I do believe it will reduce the storm by at least several categories, and relocating so many people in such a short period of time is impossible, so we have no other choice but to try it. Kelly smiled. Yes, I agree. So do we want a Category 6 blasting through Central Florida, or just two or three? She pointed a clicker at the flat screen TV on the wall and switched it on. A report was on detailing the total destruction of several hurricane islands by hurricane finale. People, look at that, Kelly said. Lifeless piles of dirt. Now imagine the same happening to the Orlando area. Do we really want to see Disney World and the surrounding areas lay waste? There are millions of people in that area. Yes, the general snapped. This is why we should be focusing on getting them out of danger and not entering flights of fancy. This system will not work, people. Mr. Fenton stepped over in front of the TV, then turned to face the assembled group. All eyes are on us, people. 
the nation is expecting action, so while I agree the system is unproven and that we should also work to evacuate as many people as possible, we must also take bold and decisive action now. I move that we call in the sub-zero subs and get them out there, under the direction of Mr Mayhew. The motion was immediately seconded and approved over the very vocal objections of General Lowe, and all eyes turned to Daniel. How do we proceed, Daniel? Kelly said. Well, we need the subs called in immediately, Daniel said. Once they're local, we can dispatch them to the storm's eye. We'll need satellite tracking of the storm on a real-time basis. Most of the people assembled began to close in around him to both congratulate him and review the plan of attack for the storm. Kelly did notice that the general was quietly slipping out of the room. She shook her head. What a jerk. Meanwhile, over the east coast of Florida, Alex Mayhew was checking over his boat. His house was still without power back in Port Charlotte so he'd driven over to the marina where he kept his boat moored and lived on it for the last several days. Hey, it may have had cramped quarters, but it was clean, dry, and it had all the proper amenities to make life comfortable, and besides, there was a liquor store conveniently located less than a block away. And so today, since the wind was picking up, he decided to go out for a sail. He hadn't bothered to switch on his marine radio or check with the harbour master or even the local weather report or newspaper. No, that wasn't his style. He had always been a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants kind of guy. So cutting loose from his mooring, he raised his mainsail and headed out of the harbour. Ah, the fresh salty air was positively invigorating. He set his course for due east. He'd head out toward the Caribbean and just see where the winds took him. Of course, off in the east were some very black storm clouds, but he barely took note of them. What did he care about a little rain? He popped an eight-track tape into his player. Ah, the big bands of the thirties and forties. Now that was his kind of music. Gabby was always after him to listen to what he called the screaming teenagers of today, but that wasn't his style. Huh. Now where was his Rudy Vallelay tape? 